This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. Find all my work at MJMunoz.com. Engine Inspection presents Super Sentai Sanctuary. I will be discussing dramatic irony. This is Super Sentai Sanctuary episode 25. Let's work together. Avatar Sentai Don Brothers episode 25. The Working Man's Hero originally aired August 21st, 2022. The writer is Toshiki Inoue. The director is Hiroyuki Kato. Hiroyuki Kato was involved with last episode, which was also a comedic episode, which was low on uh, combat. And uh, that pretty much describes this episode as well of Don Brothers. So I, uh, I think that's interesting. So I want to talk about the... Uh, <laughs> The highs, the lows, and the what's of Don Brothers, um, and uh, yeah. So here we're gonna here we're gonna, here we go. So highs for this episode, things that I liked and enjoyed were uh, it was good to see the Cerebrans come back. It was good to see that conflict get brought up again. It was interesting, or I also liked seeing Jiro and his other self interacting with each other. Uh, in a more reasonable way, or, you know, there was, there was more of an interaction, there was more of a conversation and a back and forth, and these really do feel like two different entities, and I'm curious as to what that's going to mean. Uh, I liked how sweet it was that all the Don brothers were pitching in, except for Tsubasa, to help out, <laughs> to help out their friend in need, or the friend of a friend in need. And um, I liked the monster design, at least when it got into the other world, it was a little bit of a waste uh, to have him not fighting at all, but the Hitsutsuki uh, 2.0, I guess, or I, I don't know what to call it, the AR world Hitsutsuki, he looked pretty cool, and uh, I liked the look of him, it was, it's weird how much they change, but um, like it's, it feels like a ship of Theseus thing to me, like how much can this monster change until it's not the same monster anymore? So anyway, I like its its 2.0 form. I guess you could make that form or make that argument about uh, common Rider form changes and such too. But I also think <laughs> I also kind of think form changes are a bad idea. But you know, it's carried the franchise for 20 some years, so I guess it can't be that bad, right? If it makes you toy sales, it can't be that bad. Then why the hell am I so sad? That's what I want to know. Anyway, um, so. I mean, really, so there were some cute interactions. I like Oni's sister t saying that, I mean, you know, uh, OT translated it as I'm ogre joyed. And like those folks in the in the restaurant, like fangirling over her or whatever, or whatever. It was a guy too, but you know what I mean. But it was kind of funny. It made me think like, oh, could you do like a, a maid cafe except for it's, you know, uh, Super Sentai or Tokusatsu characters? I would imagine in real life, you would have to have them have different style of gloves because I don't think the uh, official Super Sentai and Kamen Rider gloves are very, uh, I, I, I would think they diminish your dexterity too much, so I wouldn't think that'd be a good idea, but it was kind of a funny thought I had at seeing that. Uh, I don't know what else real positive stuff to say about this episode, so I'm going to go ahead and go into the, uh, the more negative side of things, and I forgot, I like to start with the negative, but uh, you know what, this time out, we're starting with the positive, going negative, and then we're going uh, in a weird direction, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, these things uh, were very odd, or, or I did not like them. Um, I didn't like, again, how distant Tsubasa is from the rest of the cast, and I don't really understand it. And the level of contrivance and coincidence that has to all work out together for them to end up in the same restaurant that Tsuyoshi was failing, and that was the reason he got fired, is... I think it's ludicrous. I don't know how else to say it, but yeah, it's at least ludicrous if not something like what's what's more ridiculous than ludicrous. I can't think of anything at this time. So I mean, maybe if, you know, it's plaid. That's how ridiculous. It's so ludicrous that it's gone plaid. That that's all I can say. And if you get it, you get it. You know, let the listener understand, and it's fine if you don't. Um, but I really disliked that. Uh, I. I don't know. I, I, I kind of disliked uh, Tsuyoshi not telling uh, Miho about him losing his job, but then again, like, the way everything's structured, he wouldn't have ended up getting his job back at the end if he hadn't. So, I mean, 
just because that's the way Inoue wanted it to be and it all worked out in the end because he's the writer of this world doesn't mean I have to like it. So, yeah, I don't like it. It's definitely a negative. Uh, another thing is uh, I dislike how long it's been since we've seen the Cerebrans. I don't need to see the face actors necessarily, but... But them not showing up for a while, even in their suits, uh, is a little bit of a problem. Although, I guess maybe, was there one? Did the dog dude, earth ground guy, Mr. Smiles, um, did he show up in the last episode? I kind of feel like maybe he did for a minute fighting against Tsubasa, maybe? Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, but still, their presence has not been made known, and it feels very much like they... Uh, have been dropped, like the thread has been dropped on them and the bestials for that matter. I don't know where they were, and I don't like the fact that we didn't get to see the bestials in this episode, and uh, that kind of stinks. Um, overall, I'm gonna give this episode another six out of ten. Like, it was there, there were things in it that I liked that were funny that kind of entertained me, but um, it just, I, I don't know, like, it's not enough to just keep me hoping. It's not, I can't live off of uh, you know, fumes, I, I gotta have something substantive, and uh. This isn't substantive, and I don't understand quite why it's waning here. I've been thinking about long-form storytelling uh, recently, um, and I was thinking about, like, you know, Digimon season. Well, Digimon Adventure is the one I'm thinking about right now. Like, I cannot think of any, like, filler arcs or places where it was slow. Like, it's 54 episodes, at least the the American version. I think it's the same with the uh, with Digimon Adventure. But um, it's 54 episodes, and that show pretty much just, like, books it from episode one and it never really slows down like there's you know there's a little bit of meandering and wandering around but even like the bathhouse uh you know when they find the the shelter episode like that's leading to their dispersion and they have to work to get back together it's like it's like there's things that get it's kind of like the mandalorian we're like i need parts for a ship like well in order to get parts for the ship you got to go fight this guy over here fine i'll go do that and then he does that and then an episode later he gets the parts for a ship and then is able to continue his journey like adventure has that kind of vibe to it versus like this i don't really feel like any of this is building towards the greater narrative and uh it's not like everything absolutely has to but this much like slowdown and stoppage in the narrative flow forward i don't really get um you know then they broke the fourth wall which i don't really that's not like it's not something i hate but it's not something i'm fond of at the end where uh haruka's like hey maybe these two get along so well because they were both hitsotsuki at one point and it's like well i don't know maybe um and like if it was just her memory or her narration going over it that would have been fine but then they do a little you know, pink circle around to Yoshi and he's like, don't remind them of that. They've forgotten or everyone's forgotten about that. And she's like, I don't think so, which I agree. I haven't forgotten about that. Um, I don't know, you know, why. Uh, and I don't know if we should forget about that as an audience or not, but I, you know, I haven't, but I don't know. I don't really understand where they were going with that. And uh, I didn't really get the point of the episode. Like it just seemed like it was a very much meandering, uh, shell of a story and I don't know what the focus is, and I don't know where it's going, I don't know what it's leading us to, and that's why I don't really like it that much. And for this episode, at least. But I do like the show overall, still. Uh, but I'm going to give this episode a 6 out of 10. It just didn't really do it for me. Uh, there were a lot of problems. Uh, like I said, there was a lot of structural issues, and yes, while there were things that I did enjoy... Uh, it just wasn't enough. It's 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 too thin, and I don't understand why everything's being spread out so much. That like I like the idea of something being decentralized and disparate, but this almost feels like anyways daring himself to see like how loosely connected can this show be and still be considered a good Super Sentai. Like it almost feels like that can't be what's going on, right? But it almost feels like that must be what's going on, and that kind of drives me nuts. Okay, so get ready. I'm gonna be delivering a blistering series of uh, real quick and hot 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 takes i guess you could say i'm going to be talking about right now the absolute worst thing in don brothers 25 the best thing and uh, the most interesting thing so i'm going to spend uh, one to three minutes on these and uh, hopefully you will like them you can uh check them out in just a couple seconds and then after that i'm going to be wrapping up the episode with a uh reflection on something about storytelling and dramatic irony so the absolute worst thing in the episode uh, 25 of Don Brothers is the weird obsession that anyway seems to have with 
not letting the story progress. So, uh, if you, if you want to put it this way, I would, you know, in a, a meme format, I would say, you know, tired is hiding info for mystery. Wired is layered storytelling with theme and ongoing intrigue. I have really liked the show so far, but just the way the story is being dragged out so ridiculously, it feels like, especially the last couple episodes, it's really getting to me. It's really bothering me. It's really not something I'm enjoying at all. And I'm becoming very frustrated with how he just doesn't want to seem to let the story progress. And there's little things going on with uh, Jiro or the Jiros, and we're just getting the tiniest little bit of them. Like, you could take, like, all the focus that they're getting could be put in a single Jiro episode that they're choosing to not give him. Instead, they're taking this very strange approach of just piecemeal dribbling out little by little what the story is going to be. And I feel like so much of, uh, I think Jin is uh, the dad, Peach dad. Like, he keeps kicking people out and saying, you know, uh, visiting hours are over and stuff, and they just kick it, get kicked out. And then he doesn't have to talk about the story. He doesn't have to tell them what's going on. And while I like the idea of using vagueness in your writing so you don't box yourself in, it seems like a lot of the story is just being winged and like the way the villains and stuff work is just being winged. And I really don't get it. It's really, uh, it's really bad. It's really frustrating. And I don't understand why any of this is happening. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely the worst thing going on in Dawn Brothers for me. That's the, the, the deepest or the, the, you know, lowest down that we've descended. Okay, so I think the best thing in Don Brothers uh, 25 is how they actually made that AR World Hitsutsuki look really cool. Uh, they even made his ribbon menacing. Like, before, when he was, you know, attacking the kids and stuff earlier, which, I don't know, he was looking for children as employees? That's, that's kind of dumb. Anyway, um, although, didn't he say that his employees were children at one point? Maybe that's the link there? I don't know, but regardless... It was goofy. He looked goofy as the regular Hitsutsuki, you know, Hitsutsuki, uh, you know, 1.0. But when he got defeated and went to the air world, uh, something like his look dramatically shifted. Um, but whatever, like the antennae things that he got were kind of interesting. But I, I guess maybe I just liked the mostly black armor. Uh, and it, I don't know, made me just like made his face and head pop. And I think they looked a lot cooler. And then even though he got pretty well uh, deflected against and countered by Jiro's attacks, uh, I still thought, like, he ripped the sword out of his hand and stuff, like, they really made that ribbon, that ribbon do the work and look good, so I was pretty impressed by that, so, you know, I guess, uh, good job, uh, I don't know if that's the fight team or the costume designing team. Okay, last thing, I want to talk about the most interesting thing in Don Brothers 25, and I think it was, uh, where are they going with this double Jiro story? I really don't understand uh, what exactly they're doing. I don't understand how it's possible that there's a second Jiro inside of him. And uh, like I said, I just, I don't really understand what's going on or where they're going or what the point is of this. And like, it's slightly intriguing. It was cool to see him uh, or, you know, the two Jiros next to, uh, you know, Momo Itaro. Um, and... Like, it feels like they're going somewhere with that. They're, they're taking one step more closer to progressing the story and actually telling us what's going to go on with them or what his real deal is. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. But, I don't know. It was still interesting to me. At least it's the thing that grabbed my attention the most. Uh, what did you think was the most interesting thing in uh, Don Brothers 25? I'd love to know. Let me uh, know in the comments. Okay, so for the reflection section, I want to talk about... Inoue and his dramatic irony or the way he uh, basically has characters not know what's going on with other characters and how he seems to use that heavily. And I, I want to know, you know, is he using that in this show specifically? And if he is, is that to great effect? I don't know. So I went ahead and uh, I found at Britannica, it's linked in the bottom of the show notes on mjwinners.com, uh, I found the... Uh, the entry there, so I'll just read it to you right now. It says, Dramatic irony is a literary device by which the audience's or reader's understanding of events or individuals in a work surpasses that of its characters. Dramatic irony is a form of irony that is expressed through a work's structure. An audience's awareness of the situation in which a work's characters exist differs substantially from that of the characters, and the words and actions of the characters therefore take on a different, often contradictory meaning for the audience than they have 
for the work's characters. Dramatic irony is most often associated with the theater, but examples of it can be found across the literary and performing arts. So, I don't know if exactly Inoue's writing style, where he has misinformation kind of rule the day, is the definition of dramatic irony or not. Because for sure I can say dramatic irony in a story where the audience knows more than the characters, yes, there is misinformation or there's missing information that causes the characters to behave in one way and the, um, the audience a different way. For example, uh, I think in Romeo and Juliet, spoilers for Romeo and Juliet, a few hundred year old play, <laughs> um, we know that Julia is not actually dead when Romeo drinks the poison. And I think that's how it goes. Yeah, they fake her death. We know that Juliet is not actually dead when Romeo uh, drinks the poison and ends up killing himself. And uh, so it's I guess it's a very short time. It's a very compressed version of that. But while he's killing himself, we know how tragic it is and how terrible it is, and we might even be screaming, no, don't do it, Romeo, she's still alive, you can be in love and live together. Um, that, <laughs> you know, we know that, so it makes it more, you know, dramatic and traumatic, um, so I can see that, and I guess if irony is just going against the grain, so to speak, uh, then that definitely qualifies, and I think, too, in Romeo and Juliet, early on, earlier on, they contemplate running away together and just living somewhere else and leaving their families behind, and had they done that, um, you know, they could have died some other way, some other tragic death, but, uh, you know, they definitely would have escaped that particular fate that they, they had of doing the, uh, you know, double suicide, um, so, I know, that's a, that's a solid example, I think. But I'm trying to think about in other works of fiction uh, what it could be. And I don't, I just don't know quite if it qualifies because, you know, there's not like a secret that Taro knows about himself and that he's hiding from others. I don't know. Would, gosh. I was going to say Kagamusha, but I don't think that's what it's called. Is it Kagamusha? Maybe. Never mind. It, it was a, it was something that appeared in Shinkenger. Uh, but it was also the name of a, oh man, what did they, the guy who did the Hidden Fortress, and uh, it's not called Rochambeau. <laughs> I am so bad at this. I am, I am not a professional uh, film critic or whatever. Kurosawa, Akira Kurosawa. Ha, there we go. Seven Samurai. I know, I know things. Anyway, um, he did something that was copied in Samurai Sentai Shinkenger, and, or, you know, utilize the concept was utilized. And I don't know if that qualifies as dramatic irony. I don't know when the audience learns that big surprise, that twist, uh, going towards the end, um, compared to the rest of the cast. And I don't know if that counts either. So I'm basically floundering, trying to figure out if he is using dramatic irony. I would say maybe technically he is, but he's probably using the most frustrating form of dramatic irony. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And, and like this, question was sparked by the fact that Subasa still doesn't know that the others are the Don brothers. The others don't know that Inui brother is Subasa, their friend who they keep working with and who keep, they keep teaming up with and who's always wearing black. And, uh, I just, I just find that so strange. I, I don't get it. Um, you've got, you know, Miho's identity as a bestial is secret. Doubling up, down, doubling down on that is Miho's identity as Natsumi and or Miho possibly being both of them is doubled down on. And also like, honestly, the audience doesn't even know who she really is. And if Natsumi became Miho or what, and I think the timeline, like I think a clear enough set of information has been presented that if we had all the facts, we'd be able to put it together. But it's kind of like, um, I've heard that at the end of, uh, certain like mystery books, you would just have some person come in who wasn't even a suspect. There'd be all these red herrings, like a whole cast of red herrings, basically. And then at the end, uh, you would have some other person come in who couldn't be part of, um, who couldn't be, like, who was not legitimately involved with the cast, and it turns out that they're the real murderer. Um, and uh, that's that's very unsatisfying, and I, I fear that that's what we're going towards, because... I don't know, is Inoue trying to just, like, be too clever? And I don't... Like, I can see uh, the appeal of dramatic irony, um, and I can see the appeal of, like, having these characters, like, tragically so close to each other and so intertwined in each other's lives, you know, to different degrees, kind of without knowing it and how that affects things. But it's just... 
I don't know, like it's getting to be ridiculous that Suasa and the rest of the crew don't know each other. And I really think, like I thought in Lupat that at some point um, that cops and robbers were going to team up together in a really legitimate way. That never happened. I thought they'd learn each other's identities, that they would work something out. Never happened. Especially because like the Phantom Thieves in that show aren't really stealing from anybody but a criminal and they're just stealing things back. Anyway, it's just a weird situation. Um, so I didn't understand what was wrong there. Uh, but then like here, it kind of makes even less sense for them to not know each other. And I was wondering a few episodes back, is Tsubasa really going to be a fugitive on the run? Okay, no, maybe he doesn't have to be a fugitive on the run. Okay, is he going to um, not learn about Natsumi and Miho until the end of the series? Okay, maybe not that. Is he not going to be known to them until the very end of the series? Maybe during the helmetless roll, roll call, somehow he'll be revealed to them. But I, I don't foresee that happening. Uh... So I think he might be, like, secretly unknown to them this entire time. And that, like, doesn't make any sense. I guess it's funny. It's subversive. But I just, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't think that's entertaining. That aspect of it is entertaining. I could see for a while. But just to keep it going, it's like, oh, this is the thing. Like, and it almost feels like the story and the characters are kind of frozen. There's, like, not, there's a prohibition on dynamism. Like, you cannot have things change in a certain way. And that, that doesn't make sense to me or appeal to me at all. So anyway, I find that frustrating, but I'm sure you find it frustrating that I keep going on about this. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and stop now. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for listening. Uh, check out, uh, Half Boiled, my ongoing coverage of Futo PI, the sequel to Common Raider Double, as well as other things I have going on. I'm, I'm doing a reaction to uh, Mass Rider, which I'm only uh, putting out on my video uh, places. Uh, someday I'll collate that or, or collect it into an audio podcast that you can check out as well, and I will announce it to you and let you know when that happens. Uh, but for now, I'm working on personal projects. I've got a children's picture book that I'm working on, a series of five of them actually, all very much inspired by Tokusatsu. Um, yeah, all very much inspired by Tokusatsu, and uh, taking the theme of some big tokusatsu properties and uh, putting them into a children's book, which will be illustrated in a cool way that you toku fans will enjoy the books. Uh, whether or not you have children, but especially if you have children, I think you and your kids will enjoy them. I'm testing them out on my kids, and I just uh, was working on uh, book number one. Uh, it's a long story, but I'm I'm doing a new book that will be book number one. It's not a prequel. It's just I had to, I restructured the series, so this is now book one, and I'm about halfway through my first draft, and uh, I'm liking it so far. And I think the the kids said uh, said made positive noises about it, so that's good. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna go and get out of here. Uh, this is MJ. I leave you with peace and blessings. I look forward to uh, you checking this stuff out next time, and I look forward to seeing your comments and hearing your comments. Uh, feel free to leave those wherever you can on the blog, on the video channels where I'm dropping this, and uh, as well as on social media, uh, Twitter, Float, uh, TikTok, and such. So anyway, uh, again, I'm getting out of here. This is MJ signing off. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, you can find more at mjmunoz.com, as well as my entire library of analysis, art, and fiction.